Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very, very honored to welcome uh, Chun uh, Wing Lam, uh, who is opening this series of uh, Curious Lam from Passionate Professionals. As uh, you know, uh, Chun is a dancer at the uh, Opera uh, in Paris, and but he will tell you much more about that. I just want to thank you again for coming. Thank you, uh, Chun me. is extremely, extremely busy, as you can imagine. He has to train every day, and uh, Chun is going to be in the Swan Lake in December, starting uh, the 10th of December. So you can imagine, plus he has <laughs> exams and uh, lots of things going on. But uh, I let you introduce yourself and uh, talk about your, uh, your journey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you for having me. So my name is uh, Chen Wing. People call me Chun in France, hope it's possible. Uh, in today's society, we talk a lot about limiting beliefs, negative emotions, and their impact on our personal development and our lives. Well, for me, limiting beliefs changed my life. And in, in particular, the limiting beliefs of one person changed my life many years ago. And I will tell you how. Nine years old, it is how old I am when my teacher decides on my future. I have just been called for an individual interview. It was to talk about the schools that my parents have chosen for me. I'm alone. Facing this teacher who has the habit of openly mocking me in class in front of all my classmates. We are at the beginning of March, a few months before the end of year exams. The room I'm in is tiny. I remember everything. Today, I still remember every word he said. Lam Jun Wing, are you applying for this kind of school? Look at you. No institution worth its sort will ever want someone like you. It is true that I'm most called a bad student. All I'm interested in is annoying my classmates, hiding their stuff, and especially imitating my mother's signature. And it is especially fun because she's a teacher. I'm bored at school, deeply bored, and I must concentrate the overflow of my energy to concentrate on subjects that are absolutely uninteresting to me. I feel completely out of step. It was impossible for me to get it, to take it all seriously. I am collecting bad grades. I lack concentration, rigor, and discipline. But underneath this mask of a dance hides a great reserve. Yes, I'm shy. At the time, in front of this teacher, I say nothing. I keep silence. But a thought grows in me. Feel grating. I will prove him wrong. So from that moment on, I decided to leave the back of the class. The final verdict of this visionary teacher acted as a revelation to me. I start listening religiously to all my teachers. I write down everything they say, every comment, every bit of useful advice. I study with boundless energy and I stop cheating in class for good. A few months later, I'm fifth out of 32 in my class, and incidentally, I am admitted into one of the best colleges in my neighborhood, the school that my parents have chosen for me, a school of excellence with an international dimension. You will tell me that I have succeeded to prove that my schoolmaster's comment was a lie. Marshall Rosenberg says that some words are windows and others are walls. The words of my teacher continued to hurt me. I'm facing a wall. So why would I stop? There? there is one thing I haven't told you. I love dancing. Not a little, not a lot, but passionately. Classical ballet. The only little problem is that I'm a boy and that I live in Hong Kong. And I can swear that a boy who practices classical ballet rarely leaves anyone indifferent and especially in a society like Hong Kong, where the codes of virility are rarely questioned. So at the age of 11, I entered this college, determined to move forward, to go higher, 
to make my dream a reality. This college is 40 minutes from my home and one hour and a half from my ballet school. I navigate between these two establishments five times a week. My daily commute is two and a half hours. The school system in which I find myself overwhelms school children with homework. And because I stay a dizzy and dreamy student, I am also often in detention after school. So in detention after school means no ballet class. But all I'm interested in is to dance again and again. The ballet class is my daily focus. So I get angry at these obstacles that come in my way. I understand that to realize my dream, I must leave. Leave the school system, the school, my family, and my country. So at the age of 12, I made my decision. I start my research on the internet, on Google, I type ballet school. The first website that appears on my screen is the Paris Opera Ballet School. I keep a clear memory of it, but I zap immediately at the time. Firstly, because the website is written entirely in French. It was impossible for me to understand how to apply and send my application. Secondly, I'm the only boy in my ballet class in Hong Kong, so it was impossible for me to compare my level comparing to other apprentice dancers of my age. So I share the idea of entering the Paris Opera Ballet School to the people around me, my parents, my friends, my, my family, my teachers. Uh, the answers all converged in the same direction. You will never enter the opera. You don't have the level. They don't take foreigners. And you don't speak a word of French. Go and live in Paris. Leave your family. How will you manage? I decide to ignore all these objections and all these predictions. So 11 years ago, I took a flight to France with my teacher. We are going to audition for the, for the Paris Opera Ballet School. It was my first visit in Paris and my first long haul flight and my first trip outside of Paris. So my first visit in Paris was amazing for me. I discover for the first time the cafes, the restaurants, all the monuments, uh, Eiffel Tower, uh, or I'm sure you understand. And of course, the Paris Opera, the Palais Garnier. My teacher takes me to a ballet performance at the Palais Garnier. And because I'm born in Hong Kong, I'm familiar with all the concrete buildings, the modern skyscrapers, so it was incredible for me to discover this building that sits proudly atop Avenue de l'Opéra in the center of Paris, which is a temple to the arts. A building imagined and designed by Charles Garnier at the end of the, dis um, of the 19th century. I enter the Paris Opera, I discover all these statues, the details of the building in inside the Palais Garnier, I walk up the Grand Escalier d'Honneur, which is a grand staircase that takes the visitors towards the auditorium of the opera. Uh, a staircase with, made of marble with different colors. Charles Garnier at the time hired the best craftsmen to decorate this opera house. He hired no less than 30, 30 painters, 73 sculptors, using 30 types of different marble coming from eight different countries. I step into the Grand Foyer for the first time. This golden room of the Ballet Garnier, which measures 18 meters high, 154 meters long. It is inspired by the Galerie des Glaces of Versailles. And of course, I'm overwhelmed by the chandeliers and the golden pillars of the Grand Foyer. 
decorated all in gold. I finally enter the auditorium of the Palais Garnier of 2000. Eugene, can you please put your mic on mute? If I can do it. Yeah. Uh, Eugene, on the three dots, that's. <laughs> so I enter this auditorium at the Palais Garnier with almost 2,000 seats all draped, all draped in red. An Italian theatre designed to see and to be seen, set under a glittering chandelier and, of course, Chagall's painted ceiling. This is my first contact with the Paris Opera Ballet, the company, not the school. Um, I saw my first ballet performance by the Paris Opera Ballet. In a few days, I will have an audition at the Paris Opera Ballet School. And of course, I asked myself whether I will one day belong to this institution. In a few days, I am admitted at the Paris Opera Ballet School. My teacher says, Chun Wing, you made history. Another person tells me, the easiest part is done. The hardest part is yet to come. Good luck. So a few months later, at 14 years old, I took another flight for Paris, this time alone, with my two huge suitcases. I, arriving in France at the Charles de Gaulle airport, I took a taxi to Nanterre. That's where the Paris Opera Ballet School is located. I still don't speak a word of French. I feel completely lost. The admission letter says that a room is waiting for me at the boarding school. So. I think I can already settle it. The taxi arrives in front of the Paris Opera Ballet School, weighed down my bulky luggages, and we find the doors closed. Only then we realize that the boarding school is closed and that the school starts the next day. I have too little cash to find myself a hotel room, and I have no other choice than to spend a night at the taxi driver's place. So that is my first day in France. To summarize my four years at the Paris Opera Ballet School would be a challenge, but all I can tell you is that my life changes radically. Nothing resembles my daily life as a ballet student in Hong Kong. In the morning, I follow the national academic programs at the school with other French kids. And I find myself learning French with fourth graders. I am 14 years old. I start um, ballet classes in the afternoon in one of the best ballet schools in the world. And also dance related subjects such as anatomy, uh, music theory, music expression, theater, uh, Baroque dance, character dance, modern ballet, and ballet history. That's when I learned about the history of ballet for the first time. I learned that it is the French king Louis XIV who was so passionate about this form of art. He is known as the Sun King because in 1653 he performed in a ballet called Le Ballet de la Nuit in Paris in the role of the god Apollon while the French king was only 14 years old. He was dressed in a golden costume representing the rising sun. That's why he is now known as the Sun King. In this ballet, Louis XIV tries to show his power. And in the 17th century, ballet is very different than the ballet that we know today. We call it Baroque dance. So with different uh, specific positions, very um, uh, very characteristics to the, to the Baroque style. The French king liked um, 
dance so much that he founded the first dance institution in the Western world in 1661. This is um, what's called the Letters Patents, Lettres Patents, which marks the creation of this institution, which was called at the time Académie Royale de Danse, which will become a few years later in 1669, l'Académie Nationale de Musique, which will become the Paris Opera Ballet that we know today. That's why on the facade of the Palais Garnier, you will see Académie Nationale de Musique paying tribute to the origin of this institution. And inside the auditorium of the Palais Garnier, you will see on the top of the stage, the son of the Sun King and the year 1669. So the year of the creation of the institution. Louis XIV liked dancing so much that he decided to create another institution, a dance school, which will form the, few, the, the dances for the, for the future Paris Opera Ballet in 1730. So this will be the first ballet school in the entire dance history. During my second year in France, so in 2013, I had the exceptional opportunity to celebrate, to participate in the celebration of the 300th anniversary of the dance school. For this special occasion, we created a new ballet called Dorsey Déjà, which is a mix between the Baroque dance and the contemporary dance. So this is me on the photo. <laughs> uh, I, had, I was lucky enough to perform this ballet on the stage of the Palais Garnier and at the Opéra Royal de Versailles, which is a theater inside the Chateau de Versailles, the, the castle in Versailles. One of my favorite traditions at the Paris Opera Ballet must be the défilé du Grand de Ballet. Every year, at the beginning of each season, the Paris Opera Ballet performs what's called Le Grand Défilé, a great parade of all these dancers. In this photo, you see students watching the dancers rehearse on stage for the défilé from the back of the stage. I was one of them, <laughs> admiring dancers and wondering whether I will belong to this company one day. Um, the stage is open all the way back, all the way up to the foyer de la danse that you see here, and it is black. The music starts, a wonderful music, the La Marche des Troyens de Berlioz, and we see a small figure at the back of the stage. It advances and we see more and more students of the Paris Opera Ballet School walking down the stage, walking down the largest stage in Europe of 60 meters long. Even though it's simply walking down the stage, I can tell you that doing it for the first time is quite scary. <laughs> Followed by more and more dancers of the company of the Paris Opera Ballet, the senior dancers, the Cordo Ballet dancers, the soloists, and the Etoile, eventually. So this is what you see at the end of the défilé, with the entire company on the stage of the Opéra Garnier, and the students of the Paris Opera Ballet School. This défilé gives you the feeling of belonging to this institution, and it is a summary of the entire journey of a dancer at Paris Opera from being a student at the school to being a dancer. Oops. So it is a magnificent moment to watch for the audience as well. Back to my boarding school. Insomnia punctuates my nights at the boarding school. I, I don't sleep anymore. I feel very scared. I'm even terrified. And you will never guess why. Because I have performed Les Fourberies de Scapin, which is a French theatre piece by Molière, alone, in front of my entire theatre class, and all this from the very first days at the ballet school. I didn't even understand that I was in a theatre class. So, because I don't sleep, I decide 
to. Nana, can you put your mic on mute, please? <laughs> So because I don't sleep, I decide to wake up early at six o'clock every morning. I isolate myself in a separate room and I work. I think by working an extra hour a day, I'm catching up with the other students, both in ballet and in French. This habit becomes an integral part of my existence, an existence that meets at this time of my life the experience of uprooting. I feel homesick. I miss my parents, my elder sister Yan Ku, my aunt Anne who lived with us, my grandmother terribly. So Anne, my aunt, is like a second mother for me and my sister. She was unmarried and took care of us since our birth with an unwavering commitment. Three months after my arrival in France, I go back to Hong Kong for Christmas vacations. My joy is immense. Hong Kong, I'm finally here. <laughs> Arriving at the airport, I run to my parents. We hugged each other. Call Anne now, they tell me. I have time on my hands. I will do it later. I'm so excited being back to Hong Kong, my hometown. These words fall like a knife. Anne has cancer. She is now at the hospital. This knife, this knife makes me understand that my life in Hong Kong will never be the same again. A year later, in November 2012, just before my anatomy exams, I cross a part of the globe to visit my aunt's bedside one last time. After her death, I discover a catalogue with all the press articles written about me. A catalogue that she kept with the pride of a good fairy. A fairy that supports her protégé unfailingly, who adheres to all his projects. My return to France is heavy. My two enormous suitcases are nothing compared to my sadness, which is immense. This sadness is there, very much there, but it is accompanied by a fierce will to make this woman proud. So I continue to get up early every morning at six o'clock at the boarding school. After two years in France, I obtained my brevet de collège with mention with honors. At the annual dance exam, I was first in my class. I took the entrance exam to the Paris Opera Ballet, which is called the Concours d'Entrée, an audition to enter the company. It was a failure. I try again. It is still a failure. Anne is there, my aunt, her smile, her gaze on me. To live up to this gaze, to live up to this family, I'm proud to belong to. That is all that matters to me. I will go all the way. In September 2015, I was the first Chinese to be hired in the Paris Opera Ballet Company. This is the realization of a childhood dream. It is a window that opens where a teacher had erected a wall. It is a gift to all those who have supported me. And it is an offering to my aunt, who lives in my every step today. I enter the Paris Opera Ballet, a company with 154 permanent dancers, with five different ranks, starting with cadre, then coryphé, sujet, premier danseur, et étoile. This photo was taken, I think, in 2013, at the, at the time when we celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Paris of Ballet School. I should be somewhere, <laughs> somewhere here. <laughs> I'm still a student. In order to go up in the ranks, 
of the hierarchy of the Paris Opera Ballet, one must participate in what's called le concours de promotion, which is translated as uh, a, con a promotional contest at the Paris Opera Ballet. So basically, we would present on the stage of the Ballet Garnier one by one, two variations, and we call in ballet variations um, solos. Those are solos that we we present one by one on the stage of the Palais Garnier once a year, often at the beginning of each November. And uh, applause is formally forbidden. It is open to public on invitation, but no one is, applause is formally forbidden. I've done many competitions in my career, and this one is uh, the first ballet competition in ballet history. It is called uh, the Varna International Ballet Competition, considered as one of the hardest in ballet, in maybe in dance, I don't know. It takes place in Varna, Bulgaria, on an open air theater, on a wooden stage, and it takes place during the nighttime from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. And when it rains, because it's an open air theater, we would go underneath the stage and wait. And we would soon go back to the same stage, but wet this time. I went to this competition in 2018 with an injury at the hip, and it was really tough. There are three rounds. It, uh, it lasts for two weeks. It was quite uh, tough. But in comparison, I find the concours de promotion at the Paris Opera Ballet worse. And actually, the Varna competition compared to the concours is fun. A typical day as a dancer at the Paris Opera Ballet starts with a ballet class with more or less the same exercises at the bar in one of the studios at the Ballet Garnier. So this one that you see is called Le Studio Petit Bar the biggest uh, at the Palais Garnier. It is just under the big cupola, the green cupola that you see from the outside uh, of the opera. The other studios are called Lifar, Nouriev, Zambelli, Chauviré. Often these are names of well-known dancers in the past. This is a view from the stage, a view of the auditorium of Palais Garnier from the stage. Um, so in the afternoon, we would have rehearsals in one of the studios or on the stage, depending on the period. It is interesting to note that the stage of the Palais Garnier is slightly inclined. There is a five degree incline, um, which allows the visitors to have a better view. Then in the evening, we might have performances. The Paris Opera Ballet holds no less than 180 performances a year in Palais Garnier and at Opéra Bastille. And when we have performances in the evening, we would um, warm up in this place called Le Foyer de la Danse, the same foyer that you saw earlier for the défilé, when the stage is open all the way back a hidden little jewel box for the dancers to warm up before each performance. And as of 2018 in the world, 72% of ballet dancers are identified as women, yet 72% of artistic directors are identified as men. These unequal power dynamics between men and women can be found throughout ballet's global history. And the foyer de la danse is, uh, is known as a lavish room at the Paris Opera Ballet where wealthy patrons could pay extra to socialize with ballerinas. But this is not the case anymore today. If I should choose one of the most iconic place inside the opera, it must be the lake underground. If you've heard of 
Phantom of the Opera, the novel by Gaston Leroux, and the musical. You might have heard of this leg, which is both fact and fiction. This is this shows the description as it is、uh, described in the novel, and this is the reality. There is actually water underground. It is quite different from the subterranean underworld fraud portrait in the novel, but it is safe to assume that the Palais Garnier today is not actually haunted. But if you are afraid of ghosts, be sure not to book tickets of the box number five, specially reserved for the phantom. Today, this underground space is used by firefighters for certain practices, and there are other people working underground. But I don't know the details about what they are doing down <laughs> underground. <laughs> and the firefighters and the people who are working underground feed the fish because there are fish in the lake of the Palais Garnier. Another place that I really like and should interest you,、uh, most of you, is the atelier de costume of the of the opera house. I come here often for fittings and for for creations of different costumes. The costumes of recent productions are stored here, and the others are stored in a separate、uh, room. What you see here are the tutus. The tutus that we we know in classical ballet, and this way of keeping them upside down is to help them to keep、um, the horizontal form of the tutus. And this brings me to the collaborations of the Paris Opera Ballet with the luxury brands. Starting with this example, is a ballet called La Source, a ballet created by Jean Guillaumbar and Nitoile. Of the Paris Opera Ballet, and the costumes are created by Christian Lacroix. There is a sponsorship by Swarovski for the crystals of La Source, and La Source is about spirits, fairies, and love. This is the story of the of the ballet La Source, and the crystals of Swarovski add. The magical dimension to the ballet. This is Christian Lacroix working with with one of the dancers of the company in the fitting rooms. The couturier who work、uh, at the atelier des costumes at the Paris Opera have worked in the very same place for twenty, thirty, forty years. So they have a real know how on how to adapt ballet costumes for the dancers because it is very important for the dancers to feel comfortable. Or dancing in the costumes, so it is fascinating for me to see them work. The atelier.、Um, Here are some more photos to show you the details of the work of Swarovski crystals on the costumes. Swarovski sends、uh, to the atelier of the opera thousands and thousands boxes of boxes of crystals, and the couturier would add them one by one on the costume. And there is another department in the atelier just in charge for the hairdress, so the hats, the crowns, for all kinds of productions, and the person in charge of、um, of the hairdress is is, is called her, her name is Corinne. I work with her often with my hairdress, and this is me in La Source. I particularly like La Source because when I was still a student, just before entering the Paris Opera Ballet, I had the incredible opportunity to replace in this ballet while I was still a student. But even more, I had the occasion to dance in one of the roles for Suzette while I was still、uh, a student. I danced in the role of the Blue Elf. So I was a blue elf. <laughs>、uh, this makeup is quite exceptional. 
and it takes a very long time to, to do it. The first time when I have when I had this makeup, I think we spent almost 40 minutes doing it. But I I think I did almost 15 performances in total. But over time, we have the habits of this makeup and we spend less and less time. But I think no less than 25 minutes for this makeup. I remember because I was part of the roles with Swarovski crystals on my body. At the end of each performance of La Souks, I would see hundreds of Swarovski crystals on the stage <laughs> of the Panagani. <laughs> and a few years later, when I was already a company member of the Paris Opera, in April 2021, I, I performed in the very same costume in a solo of La Souks in the Concours de Promotion. And it is when I was promoted to Corifé after a few years at the Paris Opera Ballet. Some other examples of collaborations between national brands and the Paris Opera Ballet. This one is uh, by Karl Lagerfeld, a, a creation for Bram Schoenberg, a ballet by Balanchine. So these are the drawings by Karl Lagerfeld. And we, of course, took a photo with, her, with him at the end of the ballet. Another example would be um, Notre Dame de Paris, a ballet by Roland Petit, and the costumes are designed by Yves Saint Laurent. And I danced in this ballet last year, if I remember well. I am the one with the yellow costume here. <laughs> Another collaboration is with Balmain for the ballet Renaissance. And as you can see, uh, these are quite heavy costumes with a lot of different details. So this is when the know-how of the Paris Opera Atelier is important. The costumes would be created in the Atelier of Balmain, then sent to the Atelier at the Opera. So the Atelier could adapt uh, these costumes for the ballet dancers. Last but not least, <laughs> the most extravagant and glamorous event of the Paris Opera Ballet is Le Gala d'Ouverture at the beginning of each season. This event is often sponsored by luxury brands like Dior, Chanel or Rolex. The public spaces of the opera house would be decorated with objects, fresh flowers, which is different each year. And all the star dancers are, of course, attending the events, joined by different celebrities. Special program for special events. It will start with, of course, um, there would be cocktail, there would be dinner at the Grand Foyer after the performance. There is an after party. So it, it, uh, it ends generally at three or, three or four o'clock in the morning. And of course, a special ballet program, uh, a performance with <coughs> starting with the défilé of the Grand Ballet and uh, a few ballets. And in the last Gala d'Ouverture, I believe it was last September 2021, it was a gala sponsored by Chanel and for this special occasion, Chanel also created the costumes for the Etoile. And so here are a few. Uh, he shows the details of this work of Chanel uh, for the Etoile dancers. And I will try to show you a video. One moment. It works. Okay. 
But ballet is not only about beautiful costumes, shiny crystals, and spotlights. Ballet is also devotion, sacrifice, and pain. The limits could come from others' beliefs, but it could also come from life. And exactly one year ago, on the 25th of October, 2021, I had one of the I had the most serious injury of my entire life. Just one week before my concours de promotion, I fractured my foot during a rehearsal for the concours. I go through, I, I had to go through two surgeries and I had to rest for 10 whole months. So I was at the hospital lying on my bed waiting for my surgery and looking at the ceiling. Instead of feeling defeated, I knew that these 10 months would be exceptional for me. I knew that I would go back on stage, this time without costumes, but in French, by having my first public speaking experience in a TEDx event. That I would finish my master at GEM that I will start a new degree in one of the best schools in wealth management in Clermont-Ferrand, and that I will start my own wealth management firm for athletes and artists. And I will go back to this very same concours one year after, presenting the very same solo. So it will be in less than two weeks. <laughs> this whole adventure from Hong Kong to the Paris Opera Ballet has allowed me to grow and has taught me at least three things. Firstly, successes are built step by step, like waking up earlier each morning to work an extra hour a day. It is enough to take one step then another with patience and awareness without the guarantee of the results, but rich in the confidence that our loved one gives us. Secondly, sometimes you have to rely on very special resources, those negative emotions that are so deprived, like anger, sadness, or disappointment. If we take the time to listen to them, we connect ourselves with our deepest needs, and it is the respect of these needs that makes us move forward and grow. Thirdly, we all have to accept the fact that around us, there will be people with limiting beliefs, people that are there to remind us that this is not for us, that all of this is impossible. It could be an old school teacher, it could be ourselves, it could be anyone else, or it could be life. Don't give any credence to this productive talk. Everything is possible, as long as you decide to go towards what you are meant to be. 
At last, I feel extremely privileged to open this series and to talk to you tonight. And I'm very grateful for all the people who have supported me during this entire journey. And even though this is not the end of my journey, I have the feeling I made it. Even if the school, my school teacher said all these years ago that no institution worth his sort will ever want someone like me, even if apparently I'm not good enough for the Paris Opera Ballet, and even if a full-time dancer will never have time to study at the same time and be a master degree graduate. So I will leave you with this. Make the events of your life the occasion of a dance where each step counts, where each support makes the difference, where each emotion will be the engine of your creativity and your freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yun. After that, you are speechless. <laughs> so inspiring. So when you have to study, you have to wake up early and then so do what you are meant to do and uh, work hard all your life during to uh, reach your goals and your dreams. But now, uh, so thanks again. Thanks a million Thank for... It was very, very inspiring. Uh, there's time for Q&A. So if you uh, wish, and I hope you have a few questions to ask, uh, questions to ask Shun, so feel free to, uh, to raise your hands and speak. And uh, for those who are online, don't hesitate as well, uh, just to, uh, to put your mic on and just to, uh, to ask your questions. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation, very touching. <laughs> I have a question, was it your dream job since you were a child or it was not the first? Uh, it was not the first yeah, because I was first, um, <laughs> I was first very passionate about classical music and I started learning piano. I started playing piano at the age of three and I started learning, I started taking piano classes when I was five and I started ballet when I was seven. So I was so passionate about piano and I was so passionate that my mother was actually worried because I was always alone uh, facing my piano <laughs> and she wanted to try to find me an activity with more socializing with different people. So she thought of class for that. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, what made you decide to pursue a business degree? I guess it is quite complicated for a dancer who just starts uh, his or her career to think about what he or she will do after after the career. And at the Paris Opera Ballet, our retirement age is forty two. So everyone who reaches the age of 42 must retire. And I started Gem when I was during my third year. So it was naturally very complicated for me to choose, uh, to know what I would actually be interested in as a, as a second career. And I chose business because I thought no matter the field, uh, by pursuing a business degree, I could that could open me doors, no matter the field. So, because I didn't know, I chose business. <laughs> <laughs> How do you plan to manage dancing experience now we are public? Yes, uh, this is a complicated question. <laughs> I'm trying. I will try to manage both. So my plan is to is to stay a full-time ballet dancer at the Paris Opera while having my own uh, business, my own wealth management firm for art artists and athletes. Um, 
because I know how difficult it might be to manage both at the same time, I decided to, uh, to merge with another uh, firm, which is a big firm, well known in the field, so that I could use their back office and their team to manage a part of the work and so that I can really try to do both at the same time. But this is still, because I just started dancing again recently. So that's the plan. And I will tell you one year later how it goes. <laughs> And um, so, do you? Uh, <clears throat> so, have you found some similarities between being uh, a dancer and a uh, professional dancer and uh, uh, man, uh, a businessman? Can we say? Yeah. Um, I see a lot of uh, differences. If I must talk about the similarities, it would be occasions like this. I think being a ballet dancer helps me to, to, to be in front of an audience. And I think it helps in a way for public speaking. And sometimes when I am with a client at a meeting, at an appointment for my business, somehow I would feel being on stage because when I explain, for example, certain things with a PowerPoint or, or something, something else, I would feel being uh, on stage doing a show. And I think it is important as well to, I, I, anyway, I could feel that my experience in ballet helped me to be confident in certain circumstances and manage stress because it is our daily life as a dancer to be on the stage with, uh, in front of an audience with 2,000 people, 3,000 people. And stage fright is something that we must master as a, as a ballet dancer. And so sometimes I would feel nervous bef before an appointment. And perhaps it could help me to manage uh, the nerves. Thank you. Would you like to stay in Paris or in the future? Would you move in another country? I would love to travel because I, I think I would love to travel. Yes, but uh, for now I will, for the long term, I will stay in Paris. I think, or at least in France, just because when we are a dancer at the Paris Opera Ballet, the theatre is in Paris. And because uh, also my second career as a wealth management advisor, which is something that is very French, and when I change country, it would be different, different regulations, different laws. So it is a very French business. So for now, I think for the long term, I will stay in Paris. Okay, to Paris, you were 14. I was 14. And so, did you do school at the opera? Like, do they let you dance and study? Or yes. how did you go? You got a degree from, like, your high school degree was from the opera? My high school degree is from the opera. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, in, in the Paris Opera Ballet School, we must follow the um, national academic programs. Education National. But with different hours, because we have to dance in the afternoon, so we have less hours in the morning for studying. It was from 8 a.m. to noon. We have academ ac academic programs. And so my high school exam was at the opera, yes. But I actually did the baccalaureate not at the opera. I was already at the Paris Opera Ballet, so I did it uh, without any school, without any establishments. I was um, en candidat libre, so I just applied for the exam myself without passing through an, um, an academic establishment. What's your 
but you live there, like like. We have a boarding school yeah, in in the school. Do you still? No. <laughs> Luckily. When did you leave? <laughs> when I was eighteen. When I turned eighteen, I had. I think. Oh, all we have to be taken care of by parents and by legal representatives. Or we must reach the age of eighteen to be not in the boarding school. So I left the boarding school when I was eighteen. But even though, even when I was at the boarding school as a student, the boarding school was only open during the week. So during the weekends, I had to find a host family、uh, in Paris. So I found the most amazing and generous and kind host families. Uh, to welcome me for the weekends from fourteen to eighteen.、Um, what gave you the idea to create your own business, and what was your idea behind it? So I knew that I I started my business after my injury because I knew I would have perhaps one year. Without dancing, I really wanted to use this time to create something, to to have different projects and to use this time well. So I started my business at that time, and I started this business also because I knew that I would graduate from Gen, and that I could use this extra time to do something else. <laughs> and the idea of starting a wealth management firm for artists and athletes is. Was quite natural. It was、um, because my master degree at Gem was about financial education for high-level athletes. So after this study,、uh, I naturally wanted to create a solution to the、uh, to the problem, and also from my observations around me as an artist, I wanted to help、uh, people with certain kinds of Wealth management-related questions. So very naturally, I had this idea.、Okay. Yeah. It's really inspiring, especially for me as a foreigner, starting, 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 and then. I have a career here.、Uh, it's really something inspired me. If I'm not coming here today,、uh, I would say I would be less inspired than yes than this moment. And also, thank you for sharing those、uh, little secrets、uh, inside Obeha, which、uh, if we are not here today, we won't know as a tourist just passing by the Obeha. And、uh, well. You are super good at managing your time, and I'm just curious, personally,、uh, how would you spend your time with your、uh, friends, partners when you are free in Paris? How would you manage your time? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> how should I spend my time? Leisure、well, time. To be very、uh, honest, I don't spend a lot of time. I don't spend a lot of leisure time. Uh, I think I had more leisure time when I was、uh, when I just started my professional career at the Paris Opera. So my first few years、um, at the company, but when I started Gem, I had less time. <laughs> And <laughs> because I was the first few years, I was just、uh, super happy, feeling free, adult,、uh, professional, And Uh, independence as a dancer, and I would just visit、um, different museums in Paris, friends, by myself, exhibitions, and in Paris, to have such an amazing offer in terms of cultural activities and exhibitions and cultural activities, theaters,、uh, performances, concerts. So it's endless, and because as a member of the Paris Opera Ballet. We have a special card from the minister, the minister, minister of culture. 
so that we can uh, enter national museums for free and without queuing up. So I would just use this card and visit so many museums by myself and with other people uh, during my first few years. That was pretty much my leisure time. <laughs> and um, of course, I miss friends uh, sometimes. And I think it is very important to have leisure time. Because I also went through uh, little, little uh, burnout uh, episodes by working too much, by not taking day offs. Uh, and I think it is really something that I learned by experience. And once you pass through that, uh, that burnout episode, you will just understand that you must force yourself to rest. So today I probably work a lot from all the ballet rehearsals and classes and practices plus uh, the, the studies that I do and managing my business. Um, but I also try to force myself to rest at least uh, half a day or one day per week. So I would, um, I would entertain myself during that day. And I think it is really important. And I absolutely don't want to spread the message that you should work very, very hard all the time. And <laughs> Any other question? What does your average day look like? Average day. Uh, average day now uh, with um with everything that i have uh i would i would work in the morning because this is a habit really i that i really kept and for all the intellectual work like uh analyzing files or study studying mm -hmm. i would do in the morning so i still wake up early relatively early it depends on the day but because sometimes i finish very late at the paris opera Performances could end at 11 p.m., 11.30, so sometimes I could not, I just can't wake up at 6 and start the whole day again. So, uh, but if I can, I would start working early in the morning uh, at 6 or at 7, and then I would go to class, ballet class, and in the afternoon I would have rehearsals and most of the time between the class and the rehearsals and perhaps between different rehearsals in the rehearsal and the performance, I would have a few hours of free time. So I would uh, or sleep or work a little bit more. But the schedule of a ballet dancer is very uh, variable. So depending on schedule, I would adapt my, my personal working plan. Yes. How did you manage stress? Okay, big chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and stress is an interesting, I think it's um, the nerves that you feel before entering, before going on stage. I think it's an interesting topic to talk about. Because when I was when I was little, I would not have stage rights. My first few years as a pianist or as a dancer, I would just go on stage and perform without any fear. But it is something that I learned to have over time. I uh, noticed that it comes more and more over time. And at some points, I really had to learn to manage the stress and the nerves. And for this, I have tried so many things, like uh, meditation, uh, homeopathy, uh, plants, Chinese medicine. Uh, sorry? Networking on this, uh, on this uh, tips. tips. Working on these tips? Now, is it working for oh, you, these tips? Some works and some <laughs> works depends on the time. Okay. Uh, 
Um, the list is very long, yeah. but I will not do the, the whole list. Uh, but I think one of the most important things to manage stress is the preparation. Because confidence is really the key to fight stage fights. When we are not confident, you could use all the techniques that you want, and they will still not work. And you don't feel confident. Sometimes you could because of lack of preparation. And so I think the best method to fight stage stage fights would be to be well prepared. Uh, so that you can be confident. And if you are still not confident, try to be confident. <laughs> Do you have like specific diet? Like, does someone take care of what you eat, or do you cook, or what do you do exactly? Because I mean, obviously, you have restrictions. Diets. Um, I don't have a specific diet. I think when we are a dancer, we spend we spend so much energy, physical energy. We have so much physical activities. That uh, weight gain is not a problem, but a goal. Because when we dance a lot, for example, during the entire month of December, with over 20 performances of Swan Leg, which will soon be the case, <laughs> sometimes we have to eat enough. And sometimes we have to find the time to eat enough in order to stay in shape, just to have the, the energy to... Uh, to dance and to stay, to stay in shape. And I personally try to have a healthy diet, not in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. So I try to stay healthy so that my, my body could uh, recover quickly and to, be, um, to perform well for the, in dancing. I don't have a specific diet. I try to. Sorry. Do you cook? I cook. Yeah. Yes, I cook. French. <laughs> um, French pika. <laughs> <laughs> not only pika. Not only pika, but I must say that pika uh, saves me quite a lot of time. <laughs> So there is one common information issue. So, uh, so there are five friends yes. from Kennedy, Pohife, Suje, Pony Bronze, and Pony Fun. There are five. And the least, uh, in terms of number of people to pass, is so three. Because from Pony Dancer to Ipwa, there is no Kungfu, which is nominated by the artistic director. So at the end of the performance, if the Pony Dancer, uh, if it is the day for the Pony Dancer, he or she would be nominated as Ipwa by, by the director. So the fastest is. Oh, yes. And how is the context from this going? Or how does they determine that you can go out to the restroom? It is a very, you mean the voting, the, um, yes. the process of the Kungfu by selecting the dancer. It is a very rigid and old system, <laughs> Com complex. Uh, fixed by the Convention Collective. Of the, of the Paris Opera Ballet. So there are rules. Uh, there must be a certain number of uh, judges at the panel. The judges at the end would vote. And in terms of the number of votes, uh, there will be a ranking. And the director would uh, promote the dancers according to the number of positions in each rank and depending on the rank.
But I don't, I don't really understand how it <laughs> works. Um, what are your goals right now? My goals right now. My goal, I think, my abs, my ultimate goal right now is to be happy, and the parents are that. Because sometimes, uh, I think there is a question about the passion. Ballet is my passion, but today. Ballet is to is also my profession, and when it becomes when a passion becomes profession, it is marvelous um, to work uh, for your passion. But I think there are also counterparts. Somehow the passion, the nature of the passion, would change a little bit, and. My wish is to stay passionate in ballet for as long as possible, and to be happy doing this at the Paris Opera Ballet. Uh, because there are hard times, there are moments when I feel tired, when I don't want to dance, when my body doesn't want to dance, when it gets hard, when I I am injured, etc. And so. That's why. That's also why I decided to start my own business, because it's like another passion, but more oriented profession. Is, I guess, a better profession. But in in terms of constraints and in terms of uh, just uh, rational criteria of a profession. Uh, so my goal is also to do well in this new career, and to be happy at the Paris Opera Valley, and to stay passionate. Because I think the risk is that uh, the counterparts of the profession um, becomes overwhelms uh, the passion, and this is what I'm trying to avoid. So this is my goal. <laughs> Maybe one last question before we end. Uh, online, do you have any question online? Anyone? You can raise your hand if you want. No, that's one. Okay. Uh, what do you fear the most in life? Because you are in control of a lot of things, like stress and different things. Do you have a dark spot? Sorry. Everyone, we're human. I think a little bit. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I found a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be a good conclusion, I think, to okay. just talk. I think my biggest fear comes from my teacher. What's what my old school teacher told me? Because she told me, I, I remember it so well. That's why I'm I'm talking to you about it, and I think it really changed something in me. And that's why I think his limiting beliefs changed my life. Mm -hmm. And so today, my biggest fear is to is not to be good enough, because I always have this fear of being not good enough. In all fields in life, no matter uh, in in dancing, in my business, in my studies, I I also have this. I also it's like my teacher is always there, reminding me, reminding me that I'm not good enough. <laughs> and so this this guides me. Some somehow it became my motivation, my everyday motivation, and it drives me. To be better and better, so that he would have no excuse to say that I'm not good enough. 
But um, of course, there are moments when we get fragile, when we are not. I cannot be this uh, this uh, successful young man all the time, strong, uh, managing stress marvelously. It doesn't happen. Sometimes, of course, I have um, periods that I feel uh, not as good, not as confident, and sometimes sad, sometimes not good enough. Uh, so those are moments. Those are moments when I really doubt, and when the the words of my teacher are more present. And it is time that I need friends or different people reminding me that I should stay confident that uh, there are people who believe in me, that uh, I can do it, etc. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And this prof was a prof from uh, Hong, Kong? Hong Kong? Hong Kong. Primary school teacher. Um, okay, I primary. was nine years old. <gasps> okay. Nine years old. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I never, I still haven't uh, seen him again since <laughs> all this time. I should go back and see him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you should see him. Yeah. 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 I think you have another question. I wanted to ask if you saw the teacher again. <laughs> I was invited by my primary school for one event. Once. <laughs> <laughs> After my entrance at the Paris Opera Ballet, mm. uh, there were press articles in Hong Kong about my success and about me being the first Chinese. So they, are, they were very happy. And after this, my primary school, so where my teacher works, wrote me and invited me to to an event at the school, but my teacher was not was not there. But I believe he's still working in the school right now. But I should thank him. I I'm 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 speaking to you tonight uh, without any hatred. I really should thank him for indirectly for the words that he he told me all these years ago. Without which, perhaps I would not be here tonight talking to you. So I guess life is well done and that uh, destiny is well planned and destiny decided that this teacher at this moment of time had to speak to me this way. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.